It is now time for oral questions. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thanks, Peter. My question uh, to the Premier. Uh, Premier, uh, momentarily, the uh, member for Etobicoke Lakeshore, uh, Doug Holliday, was tabling a motion calling on the government to make good on his promise to people of Scarborough in the recent by-election to build the subway line as requested by City Council. Uh, I want to congratulate the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore for bringing this to the floor so quickly. A uh, question uh, back to you, Premier, is will you support the motion? Will you actually keep your promise to the people of Scarborough? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it, I have to say, it is refreshing to hear the uh, leader of the opposition about time. coming forward talking about transit. Yeah. And I think about that's time. great, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. I think that's just yeah. wonderful. And as the leader of the opposition knows, since we came into office, we've been investing in transit. There are projects happening all yeah, over the province, like Mr. Speaker. Way. In fact, there is building going on in Ottawa, in Kitchener-Waterloo. There's building going on within the GTHA, Mr. Speaker. There is transit money being used across the province as a result of the, uh, the gas tax investments that we have made, Mr. Speaker. So there is a lot of work that is happening right now. I think our commitment to building transit is evidenced by the work that is happening, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we have been working with the City of Toronto on this uh, on this file. We've listened to the, the members from Scarborough. We've listened yes, to the people of Scarborough. We're committed to building a, a subway in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker. We've committed $1.4 billion and another $320 million to the station. Mr. Speaker, we will build that subway. Well, uh, back to Premier. I, I listened carefully to the Premier's response. I, I simply asked you keeping a promise. I, I didn't hear either a yes or a no. And I'll tell you why I'm concerned. Um, Premier, it was uh, March of uh, 2012 that we brought forward a motion in the House of and my name is Leader of the Opposition to build subways uh, in Scarborough. That was our motion we brought on the floor over a year ago. I'm proud of that. We've been consistent. You, Premier, and your Transportation Minister, you voted against it. Uh, you referenced yesterday your uh, canoe trip over the summer. You probably saw a lot of carp flipping and flopping in the river that you were in. Are we seeing the same thing here today? Yes. You're not going to flip flop. Are you flip flopping? Honest to goodness, it's hard to tell where you stand on the issue. Just yes or no, Premier. Are you going to keep your promise or are you going to flip flop yet again? Premier. Mr. Speaker, as I, uh, as I said, we. We have been committed to building transit, and we will continue to build transit, Mr. Speaker. We're committed to building the subway in Scarborough, but the piece that the Leader of the Opposition is missing in this is that we have to work with partners. We have to work with the municipalities, Mr. Speaker. And the fact is that the Leader of the Opposition is coming into this discussion talking about one project to which we're committed. We've said, in answer to your question, we've said we— Excuse me. We're back to that little habit that we were in, out of uh, during the summer break, which was when the question's being put, I'm hearing people from that side heckling while the question's being put, and while the answer's being put, I'm hearing heckling from this side. So I'd like all of us just to simply stop the heckling. And the member from Renfrew doesn't help his case at all for today. Answer, please. The, the Leader of the Opposition is coming in on one project in one region as opposed to uh, understanding that tr building transit is uh, a, it's a systematic Answer. approach that has to be taken and we have to work with partners. But we're committed to building transit in Scarborough and we're committed to building the subway in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker. Oh, supplementary. <laughs> I, I don't know, Speaker. I've, I've never seen this kind of quality of verbal gymnastics on a simple yes or no question. Are, are you going to keep your promise? Or not. The, the Premier said, well, you have to work with partners. I remind you, Premier, just a couple of weeks ago, your Minister of Transportation, Mr. Murray, went out there and all of a sudden launched his own brand new plan that nobody had heard of. Council did not support. The TTC did not support. Scarborough residents did support. Metrolinx didn't support. Nobody supports that plan. The, the promise of the by-election was absolutely clear. A line going from Kennedy up to Shepherd through Scarborough City Centre. Your minister invents a new project with less money, fewer stops, lower quality. Listen, people in Scarborough run into brick walls for fall too long. We're going to put you up against that same brick wall with Doug Holliday's motion. Are you going to keep your promise or are you going to flip flop Question. right out of the gate? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think that 
if the Leader of the Opposition might want to have a conversation with the new member from Etobicoke Lakeshore and talk about exactly what has gone on at City Council over the last couple of years, talk about how contentious that issue has, this issue has been, understand from the, uh, from the uh, member from Etobicoke Lakeshore where the money is coming from, where the $1.4 billion and the extra $320 million is coming from for the project, and that would be from this government, from the provincial level, Mr. Speaker, not from the city, not from the federal government. So I think member if the Leader of the Opposition to wants to talk to the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore and just understand the context that has been in place for the last three years, Mr. Speaker, as we've gone back and forth with the City of Toronto, that might be very helpful for him because he, he's coming in late in the game on one, one project, Mr. Sir. Speaker. We're committed to building the subway in Scarborough and we're committed to working with our municipal partners. Thank you. New question? Uh, firstly, Mr. Speaker, I would like to apologize for calling you Madam Speaker yesterday. <laughs> that, uh, that really stems from a long-time habit I've had at some other establishment. <laughs> My question today, though, is for the Premier. A few months ago, your Minister of Transportation said that it would be difficult for Metrolinx to proceed if Toronto City Council and the TTC are not supportive of the transit options that have received municipal approval. Now, your government has ignored the City of Toronto by offering a shortened version of the Scarborough subway. Mr. Pre or Madam Premier, why have you decided to move forward without the City of Toronto and the TTC? Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, order, order. I'll be waiting for the last person to try to get the word in because it's quiet. Minister. Mr. Speaker, you know, I also predicted a few few weeks ago or a month ago that the member from Etobicoke Centre would be here representing the mayor's views, and he's from, and from Etobicoke Lakeshore, and he's doing exactly what we said, and he's doing exactly what conservative politicians in this house, conservative politicians at City Hall, and conservative politicians in Ottawa do with subways in Toronto. They pass motions, they never write checks. Oh. Here we have, Mr. Speaker, classic civic provincial federal conservatism on subways. Yet another motion. I would suggest to my friend from Etobicoke Lakeshore and his friend Mayor Ford, who have such great relationships with Mr. Uh, Flaherty, that maybe they can together get Mr. Flaherty to write a check for a subway in Toronto. We are not, Mr. Speaker, going to build subways in Scarborough on motions and rhetoric and press releases. We need money, and the only people putting money in the subways, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. M Mr. Speaker, it's, it's going to be very difficult to build a subway in Toronto or anywhere else without the government of Ontario's support. The trouble here is that the government of Ontario has been all over the law on both sides of this question. They Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You cannot be on all sides of this equation. This is not a merry-go-round. You can't get off whenever you want. Yes. So I, I just want to know: Are you really on side this time? Are you really going to follow your plan, or you're not? Minister. For agreements, Turkey. Um, Mr. Speaker, we have come to understand that Conservatives love to fill in subways, bizarrely champion them, but they never like to pay for them, Mr. Speaker. And the other thing we know about Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, like the Honourable Member from Etobicoke Centre, they don't like to read. They don't read budgets and they don't read plans, because if they'd actually read a plan, the Leader of the Opposition would know he was dead wrong again. The line on that map has not changed in one single plan. We're following the same route that we ever had. 
The only change, Mr. Speaker, we have never changed our position once. The flip-flopping carps are over there, Mr. Speaker. And what is the price tag for that whipped up, out of the blue thing that the member for Etobicoke Centre got? Answer. Three billion dollars, oh, Mr. Speaker. Dear. Three billion dollars. The fiscal prudence for Conservatives is when you can build a line point one, one point four. Don't I'd like to gently remind all members, when I stand, you sit. And I'll say it again so that the minister is looking at me when I say it. And this is a gentle reminder for everyone. When I stand, you sit. Final supplementary. Well, yes, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Premier, you wanted LRTs. Then you changed your mind. You, you asked. You asked council for support, and then you acted on your own. Last year, you voted against a motion supporting the, separate, the Shepherd Subway extension. Then you flip-flopped it on LRTs. Then you flip-flopped on the Scarborough Subway. Now, people in Scarborough, they want you to—they don't want you to break another promise you made during the election. What is so it, we're back to trust. After the gas plant scandal, we know Liberals will do anything it takes to win. I, uh, I uh, am asking for quiet, and that should be obvious that no one else would add their two cents worth, like the member from Durham, while I'm speaking. The member from Oxford, I hope that we don't have to go to the medic to take care of your hand or else repair that desk. <laughs> You have a short wrap-up for your question. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, the people, the people of Ontario do not trust this government. Premier, with your chronic flip-flopping, uh, the transit question. voters of the City of Toronto can never trust you. You've got to make a solid decision, and you've got to stick to it. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I have to apologize to the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. I had suggested he had moved to the centre. I was clearly wrong. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, $16.4 billion in 15 rapid transit projects, a consistent plan. Our Premier, we have not moved off of one inch. Mr. Speaker. There are more Conservative MPs and City Councillors, and now one MPP, and together they can't come up with 4 per cent of the solution. The member opposite and I both were mayors, Mr. Speaker. Both of us know we start conversations with one-third. Why doesn't the member opposite ask the federal government why in Kitchener and Ottawa the federal government pays one-third of transit costs, but in the 416 in his area? Four percent, Mr. Speaker. The gap between us and the and the dreams that pe and the transit system people in Toronto deserve is one word, Mr. Speaker. It's conservative. When you, you vote conservative, you get whole filler. No Thank you. New question, leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the premier. The people of Ontario have sent us a pretty clear message. Focus on delivering results that create jobs, that improve their health care, and that make life more affordable and that make government more accountable. Does the Premier have a problem with any of this? No. Absolutely not, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, that's exactly what we're doing. Our investments in uh, in people and in business and in infrastructure are designed to do precisely what the leader of the third party is talking about, Mr. Speaker: to grow the economy, to create jobs, and to uh, to make sure that we help people in the, in their day-to-day -day challenges. And that's. That's the kind of initiative that is included in our budget, Mr. Really speaker. That's too. the work that we have been doing over the last eight months and before, and that's the work that we will continue to do, I, uh, I hope, with the cooperation of people in this House. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, people look to the government for leadership, and what they're seeing these days are some pretty 
cynical games. Whether it's playing political games to make their budget numbers look good or using a plan to protect youth from cancer risk as a political football, people actually expect better from their government speaker. Will the Premier stop playing these same old political games and start focusing on results that people need? So, Mr. Speaker, again, I'm not sure um, what the leader of the third party is referencing, but if she is talking about the announcement that the, uh, the Minister of Finance made yesterday about our overachievement on our budget and the fact, Mr. Speaker, on our, on our deficit, Mr. Speaker, and if she's talking about the way we are managing the finances, that the audit. You may be in volunteering yourself. Premier. Mr. Speaker, the, the fact that the Auditor General has signed off on the numbers that were released yesterday, I think, should give the, uh, give the leader of the third party and certainly the people of Ontario some confidence when we say that the 2012-2013 uh, deficit is now down to $9.2 billion, yes. that we're $5.6 billion lower than was projected in the 2012 budget, Mr. Speaker, a further Answer. reduction of $600 million since the 2013 budget, Mr. Speaker, and that's for the first time in a decade, total spending fell from the previous year. So, Mr. Speaker, spending is down, as we said it would be. We are constraining spending. We are overachieving on Thank our you. targets. That's good news. Thank you. I'm going to uh, mention the member from Renfrew and the member from Peterborough. I don't want to have to come back to you. Well, Speaker, this week we started debating, debating the uh, Financial Accountability Office. I'm sure that office will have some things to say about uh, Liberal numbers. Uh, but as we go uh, forward, we're going to keep working to ensure that home care wait lists are actually going to go down in this province, that auto insurance rates uh, are going to go down, and that youth unemployment is going to go down. People remember this government's track record, Speaker. They know that Liberals only move to protect youth from tanning beds because it would according to a Liberal staffer, quote, make a fabulous headline to detract from gas plants. Wow. Now they know this government is only moving on youth jobs, home care and accountability because new Democrats demanded it, Speaker. They want to see results, Speaker, but they've lost trust in this government. Is the Premier ready to focus on results for the people who elected us, or are we going to see more of the silly political games that Liberals like to play so much? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, first of all, I just want to uh, I just want to say that on this side of the House, we have a lot of confidence in the Auditor General, and when the Auditor General signs off on numbers, we really we really support that, you know, and that's why that's why that scrutiny is so important. In terms of the deep cynicism around the actions of the government, I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, that our commitment to improving kids' lives, all of the changes that we've made in education, Mr. Speaker, the supports that we've put in place for for communities, the, uh, the fact that we are uh, continuing to implement full-day kindergarten, Mr. Speaker, all of those are evidence of our commitment to uh, the future, to making sure that the investments that we make improve young people's lives into the future. So the measures that are included in our budget, yes, Mr. Speaker, are an extension of that. The leader of the third party chose some issues as we went into the budget last year that she knew perfectly well we wanted to take action on. We've taken action Thank on those, you. Mr. Speaker, and they will improve people's lives. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Speaker, uh, this next question is for the Premier as well. A simple step the Premier could take today would be to ensure that the committee looking into wasted millions at the gas plant is able to actually do its job. When the Premier was respecting, or sorry, rejecting calls for a public inquiry that we were calling for earlier on, she insisted that, that's, that this committee was going to be able to have all their questions answered. But, Speaker, we all know that hasn't been happening. And for two days, the Premier has refused to say, to say in this House whether she'll do anything about it. Is the Premier going to open up the gas plant committee so that Ontarians can get answers about Liberal political interference, or will she keep protecting her Liberal friends? Oh. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I have a lot of respect for the procedures of this Legislative Assembly, and I do not control committees, Mr. Speaker, and I think it's, it's fairly clear, Mr. Speaker, that the chairs of committees take their advice from the clerk, and then the committee makes those decisions. And the fact is, Mr. Speaker, in a minority parliament, we don't control the committees. The committees are a reflection of the makeup of the House, Mr. Speaker, and so, in fact, the NDP and the Conservatives can work in committee and they can make uh, they can make those decisions. I've been clear that my position is that the committees uh, the committee should have the opportunity to ask the questions that it wants to ask. So I I turn to the committee and I say, Mr. Speaker, I hope that they will work to ask the questions that they want to have answered, that they will provide Answer. opportunities for people to come forward, and I will leave that up to them to make those deliberations, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, <laughs> yesterday the Premier said the Justice Committee has her blessing to ask the questions it needs. Well, that's very nice, Speaker, that's very nice. But the Premier's blessing does not get Ontarians answers about questions that are being blocked at committee. Now, what will get answers, Speaker, regardless of her refusal to acknowledge it, what will get answers is the Premier supporting an expanded scope of this committee. Will the Premier support expanding the scope of the Justice Committee, or will she keep protecting well-connected Liberal insiders? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I really believe that the committee needs to be allowed to do its job. And from, from my perspective, every person that the committee has, uh, has wanted to call has come forward, as far as I know, Mr. Speaker, from, uh, from the, the Liberal Party. As the committee has asked people to come forward, they have come forward. As the committee has asked for documents, they have received those documents, 135,000 of them, Mr. Speaker. So, um, you know, I'll just, I'll just put the sarcasm aside when I said that the committee has its blessing. I meant that, has my blessing. I meant that. I meant that if the committee wants to, uh, if the committee wants to ask particular questions, they want to make decisions. It's up to the committee to do its work with advice from the clerk, Mr. Speaker. But I think that, uh, I think that they've had a broad Answer. scope, and they should be able to continue to exercise that. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, it's a pretty interesting day today, Speaker. The Premier has said she wants transparency. On April 25th, she said, and I quote, I said I was committed to being open and transparent. All the questions that were asked were going to be answered, end quote. On April 16th, she said, from what quote, from one day, sorry, from day one, when I came into this job, information that was being asked for needed to, uh, needed, asked for needed to be available, end quote. Earlier this week, she said she will, quote, make sure that as questions are asked, they get answered, unquote. She said the same thing again today. But the Premier needs to know, Speaker, we are asking the questions about Liberal interference with the Speaker. Will the Premier make sure that those questions get answered at committee? Thank you. Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm pretty sure that that the particular issue that the uh, leader of the third party is referencing got addressed by you earlier this week, Mr. Speaker, and so I, you know, I am not going to weigh into that. What I will say is that the committee has the authority to ask the questions that it chooses to ask with the advice of the clerk, Mr. Speaker. If there is a discussion that needs to happen among the House leaders, Mr. Speaker, in terms of changes. As the Premier and the leader of this party, I'm open to that happening. The House leader can meet with the uh, House leaders from the opposition and the third party. They can have that discussion. I remain committed to uh, being open and transparent on this issue. I have said that as there are questions that come forward, I want those questions to be answered. This is Answer. not about protection of anyone. It's about opening up the process, and that's why the boxes of paper, all of the information that has been made available, Thank has you. been made available, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. New question, the member from the PN Carlton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Um, earlier today, part of your caucus in the Public Accounts Committee supported uh, our motion um, to finally learn the true cost of the reopened negotiations between the teachers' contracts last year. Uh, today in the Toronto Sun, it's been estimated that uh, that cost could be as high as $500 million. But what I am concerned about is the fact that your party is split. And it was very clear in, 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 your, uh, in, in the Public Accounts Committee today that you were, you were split. So my question is, uh, will you finally be open and transparent with the tax to reveal these true costs, 
And given the Auditor General's report into the gas plants, one of my major concerns is that your party will obstruct legislative officers as well as members of this assembly in getting the true cost. And can we make a, com can we make a commitment from you today, very public, that Question. you will not get in the way of getting those answers out to the public who very desperately want them? Yes, thank you, and I, I'm very pleased to respond to this because, in fact, uh, we have been quite open about what the financial considerations are here. We announced in January of 2013 that we had reached savings of $1.8 billion as a result of labour negotiations, and as of today, we continue to achieve savings of $1.8 billion. Nothing has changed. Now, what we clearly are uh, very pleased about is that as a result of our discussions with our friends in uh, the various teachers groups and the various support work, education support workers groups, that we have in fact achieved what we wanted to achieve, which was a good start to the school year. And I can tell you, any parents and grandparents that I have spoken to in the last few weeks are absolutely delighted that we have received a good start to the school. Thank you. This minister did not provide me with any cost whatsoever. In fact, after six months of asking, doing uh, order paper questions, asking questions in this assembly, not once did she provide me with a detailed breakdown of what this costs. Now, Mr. Speaker, you'll understand when I get concerned as a mother in the, with my child in the public education system when the teacher, when, when the education minister in this house says that her number one priority minister, the environment is to order. not educating students in our classrooms. It's a very big challenge for us to believe this government on this side because they don't. They don't want to tell us what the true costs are. And I, I also am very concerned because this is the Premier who um, effectively campaigned to get the support of the teachers' unions by accepting tens of thousands of dollars from them in the last year. She uh, then decided to repeal Bill 115 at the union's request. She decided to appease the unions by pushing out the former minister. And all I am simply asking on behalf of parents, teachers who want to teach, and students and members of this assembly, will they Thank do you. their job? Will they provide us with the information? And will Thank you. You'd like it to be brought. Unlike the party opposite, we actually do believe that teachers want to teach, and we're very yeah. appreciative of that. But I must say, in terms of confusing numbers, the member opposite has claimed we have a $100 million bill, a $300 million bill, a $500 billion, million bill. You know, Speaker, I want to get the accurate numbers. So what we did is we struck an implementation cost estimate working group, and we have been working with school boards over the course of the summer working through each item accurately and getting the actual figures from the school board. We have one or two items remaining, Answer. and when we have those accurate numbers absolutely Member from nailed Prince down, Hastings come to order. we will, in fact, release the accurate actual cost, Thank you. and I'm quite prepared to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is for the Prime Minister. Colleagues and I have been urging this government to regulate the tanning industry, but for five years, this government has let the bills languish despite the fact that we knew of the cancer risk. Speaker, this bill could have passed in 2008, in 2010, in 2012. Right now, it feels like a cynical game is being played on the back of cancer patients. If the Premier is not playing politics, then why didn't she pass this bill when she had a majority government? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Uh, Speaker, I, I am asking all members of this legislature to work together for the benefit of the people of Ontario. Speaker. We have an opportunity to pass this bill by the end of September. We need a party to stand with us to get that job done. 
Speaker, the member opposite's commitment to this tanning legislation is impeccable. She clearly supports this legislation that was first introduced by Khalil Ramal, Speaker, in 2008. Since 2008, cancer patients have been waiting for us to take the step that almost every other province has already done. Speaker, we can get this done by September 30th. It's time to put the political gamesmanship aside and get this do job done. Speaker, thanks to the good work of the Cancer Society of Kate of the Melanoma Network, right now, if anyone in this House was to hold up this bill, they would be on the front page of every media with a set of red horn and a long pointy tail. Nobody is going to hold this bill up. We've discovered that the only reason that this government suddenly became interested in the bill was to distract Ontarians from the gas plant scandal. Instead of actually delivering results for Ontarians, why is the Premier more interested in manufacturing a crisis when, in fact, everybody agrees that it is time for this bill to move forward? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, speaker, the member opposite was uh, present this morning at uh, a media conference. She heard firsthand from the people who were advocating for speedy passage of this bill. The Canadian Cancer Society, melanoma survivors, Speaker, of uh, the Ontario Medical Association. There is overwhelming consensus that passing this bill is the right thing to do. It has been introduced by. Minister. Speaker, this bill or a bill similar to this have been introduced five times. Five times the hopes of the cancer survivors have been raised and then dashed. Speaker, we have a plan to get this done by September 30th. I don't know why both parties are standing with us together and saying we can get this done. Let's get work together and get this legislation passed by September 30th. Thank you. New question. The member from Ajax Pickering. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Parents and families in my community of Ajax Pickering want to know if this government is serious in its commitment to protect the health of our sons, our daughters, and our children. In March, the minister introduced the legislation that, if passed, would, access, would restrict access to tanning bed services for Ontario under 18. My question, straightforward, could the minister tell us when she expects this legislation to move forward? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Ajax Pickering for uh, this very important question, Speaker. And as we were saying, this Skin, uh, Skin Cancer Prevention Act 
uh, represents common ground. All three parties agree that this legislation should move forward. Speaker, there has been broad consensus that this is the right thing to do, but unfortunately, this legislation has been blocked. It has not moved forward because the PCs have been extending debate for 55 hours on three other bills blocking the progress of this legislation. We can no longer allow this legislation to be held up. The longer this legislation is delayed, Speaker, uh, the worse it is for our young people. So we'll, we will be moving a programming motion. I look forward to the support, Speaker, of the party's office. Answer. Again, supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, it's great news for all Ontarians that we have an opportunity to pass this vital legislation swiftly. It seems to all of us in the House that we agree in restricting young Ontarians' access to tanning services is vital to protecting their health. However, as you have noted, this bill has needlessly been delayed. Can the minister, through you, Speaker, tell us why it's important to have this done so quickly? Thank you. Mr. Uh, speaker, it's quite aware that there is broad support for this legislation to move forward, and for a very good reason, Speaker. The dangers uh, of exposure to artificial radiation for young people have been very well documented. Speaker, I've been disappointed Order. that the Leader of the Opposition kind of fluffed it off as not an important issue. I tell you, this is an important issue, Speaker. The member from Renfro maybe didn't hear it while he was yelling. I said he is warned. Finish your answer. Uh, speaker, uh, at the end of question period, I will be moving unanimous consent. Sal Muskoka. Speaker. Speaker, I have a question for the Premier on the Ring of Fire. Premier, your government has done a lot of talking about the Ring of Fire. You've toured the project in throne speeches, budgets, debate, and in response to questions here in the Legislature. But despite all this talk, we are seeing very little progress made on the Ring. In fact, things have taken a step backward recently with major players choosing to put their operations on hold punctuated by the decision by Cliffs Resource to suspend work on their, their environmental assessment. Premier, since becoming leader of your party, have you met with Cliffs, Norant, or KWG, all key players who will create thousands of jobs for Ontarians by developing the Ring of Fire? the question from the, uh, from the member, and indeed the Ring of Fire is a very exciting uh, economic development opportunity for, uh, for certainly not just Northern Ontario, but for the whole province of Ontario. We are working very, very closely uh, with all the companies involved in the Ring of Fire, uh, certainly including the companies that the member mentioned. But I think what's extraordinarily important for us is to, is to take the good news that's coming forward. For example, the fact that the, uh, we are working so closely with First Nations, right set of negotiations yeah. uh, on a regional framework basis led by the Matawa First Nations, led by Mr. Ray, and by having hiring Mr. Asking Frank Yakabuchi to take on the uh, provincial negotiating role, which is moving forward in a very positive way. Just this morning, for example, uh, members may not know that uh, uh, the uh, application for a judicial review has been actually withdrawn You're by the Matawa Food Commission. Showing real confidence, may I say, in the process that's moving forward with Mr. Ray and Mr. Yakabuchi. So, uh, indeed, a complex, extraordinarily 
I stand you sir. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's, it's hard for the minister to provide a useful answer to a direct question asked of the Premier. So again to the Premier, even in the face of prominent miners criticizing delays in the approval process, and I, and I quote, unresolved agreements with the government of Ontario sir, the are critical to the project's economic viability, close quote, you insist that the Ring of Fire is moving ahead. Premier, for claiming that your government would, would, would make the North a priority, your actions have done little to signal that there's been any real change. While getting the Ring of Fire right is important, there needs to be real action to show that you're committed to creating Northern jobs. With yesterday's ruling of the Land Commissioner in mind, why should miners continue investing millions of dollars to stay afloat in the Ring of Fire when there's so little action on the part of your government? Biggest champion of the North, right here. You know, it's, it's, what's, what's so absolutely crucial to is that we do have the support of all three parties of the legislature to move the project forward as well. Certainly, uh, what, the, the, what the information related to the withdrawal of the application for the judicial review is in a very important piece in terms of moving the project forward. There's no question. We do indeed agree we all need to get it right. And that certainly includes working on making sure that the First Nations that are closest to the Ring of Fire are absolutely going to benefit from this project. And that is certainly one of the goals that we have. It's also one of the very clear goals of the major companies involved in this project. And I think if you're talking to Cliffs Natural Resources or you're talking to NORAP Resources or you're talking to KWG or Canada Chrome, they're also working very, very closely. We are extremely encouraged by the decision to withdraw the judicial review. The issue related to the Mining and Lands Commission is, a, is one that we are we're looking yes, at very, very closely, obviously, between Cliffs and another company and, and, to, uh, and KWG. So the long and the short is it's a great project. In a room. It's, this is a project... Your question the member from Trinity Spadina. My question is to the Minister of uh, Transportation and Infrastructure. Yesterday we learned that the Minister Scarborough Transit Proposal 1 does not have a detailed cost estimate. 2 would likely cause delays and cost overruns in the Eglinton Crosstown uh, line. 3 requires Toronto Council approval and willingness to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in sunk costs and cost overruns? Why is the minister undermining transit expansion in Scarborough by floating a plan with so many flaws, roadblocks and uncertainties? Mr. Speaker, what we learned yesterday that it's never been the minister's plan. It's actually been a plan worked on very diligently between Metrolinx and MTO. It's actually the same plan that we've had for a very long time. I, I, I don't think you, know, you just click twice on the MTO website, it pops up. And, and if you go back through time regression, you'll actually see the same line is there. We asked the city one question, Mr. Speaker, do you want an LRT or a subway? Because our members now for 20 years have wanted a subway, and it was previous city councils that said they did not want a subway. When the council in May changed its mind to agree with my colleagues like Minister Duguid and my many MPP colleagues from Scarborough who've been elected on a subway, they said to me as Minister Edge of the Premier, can we do it? We did it. Answer. And we're going to do it with as minimal changes as possible. We're sticking to the same plan. There's no changes. The only flip-flops have been in the NDP, and the only government that's changed its position is Thank the city, you. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. What uh, pops up is this. <clears throat> the minister is running roughshod over Metrolinx by pushing a proposal that won without knowing how much taxpayer money will be wasted by breaking contracts with Bombardier and other suppliers. Two, without the agreement of Toronto Council to cover sunk costs and cost overruns, and without confirmation that the plan is technically feasible. What price will the City of Toronto, the TTC, Metrolinx, and above all, the taxpayer pay for the Minister's arrogance and self-serving scheme? You know, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have been accused of, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of drawing some hard edges, but I don't personally attack people like the member opposite just did. Second, Mr. Speaker, very, 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 very quickly, Mr. Speaker, I, I know the Conservatives who, and the NDP who like to debate 
uh, debate subways. They don't like to build them, and they propose motions, and the member for Trinity Spadina wants us to get into another debate. Mr. Speaker, we're not debating subways anymore. We're not debating transit. We're building it, and we're building it now, and I'm not interested in politicians who want to move motions. The people of Scarborough are fed up with the politics of this. The people of Scarborough are getting their subway, Mr. Speaker, on budget, on time. Enough talk, Mr. Speaker. Let the member for Ontario Centre continue his rants from, uh, from City Hall and move more motions here. We don't need City Hall politics here, Mr. Speaker. We certainly don't need the NDP, who have no position. No question. The member from Scarborough, Gilmore. Thank you, Speaker. The question is for the Minister of Municipal, Municipal Affairs and Housing. I have heard from a number of my constituents in Scarborough Guildwood who live Order. in cooperative housing that they have to go to court over an issue in their co-op. They say that this process is expensive and time-consuming for both the cooperative and the member involved. This is an expensive it is an expense that is often prohibitively expensive for both parties. They are frustrated that tenants in rental properties seem to have better access to dispute res resolution mechanisms such as the landlord and tenant board than they do. And they have asked me why our government Question. had yet to help them reform this process. And I think that this is a fair question. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, could you please explain Thank what you. Bill 14 would do to help co-ops and their members Thank with you. these Thank costs? Thank you, Speaker. And I just want to start by congratulating the member from scarborough gilward on her successful election and her question sure. to the House. This is a very timely question because Bill 14 is actually going to committee today, and I know we have a number of the members of the co-op housing, uh, the hardworking members here today. I want to remind the entire House about the important role that co-op housing plays in, in uh, providing affordable housing to Ontarians across this province. However, co-op uh, cooperatives have what can only be described as a complicated and expensive dispute resolution process, having to use the courts. That is unlike most tenants and landlords in Ontario who are able to access the landlord and tenant Order, board to resolve please. a variety of disputes without involving courts or pricey lawyers. It's an issue of fairness for Answer. those who are least able to afford the costly court process. That's why our government introduced Bill 14, and that's why we urge the opposition and the third party to work with us and pass Thank you. Bill 14. It's time to give Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I would like to ask the minister, through you, because I've heard from some people in Scarborough Guildwood that they are confused about how this bill is different from an earlier one. They have heard about an amendment that would allow the Landlord and Tenant Board to waive application fees. This causes many of them to worry that this would only increase the number of cases being heard by the Landlord and Tenant Board, leading to longer delays and less justice for tenants. While I am new to the Legislature, I know there have already been questions in this House about this very issue. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, could the Minister explain how the fee waiver to the Landlord and Tenant Board would work and the rationale for including it. Thank you. Minister, that's that's pretty you. general. You're not helping. I want to uh, comment also that the member from Leeds Grenville raised this issue, uh, and we've had this debate in the House and previously questioned why we included this amendment. In short, the speaker, speaker, the reason we proposed this amendment was to ensure fairness for all Ontarians, no matter what their income. Currently, all applicants to the Landlord Talent Board uh, have to pay a fee to have their case heard unlike many of our other boards and tribunals, meaning that a tenant whose only source of income is a disability benefit might have to choose between seeking redress at the Landlord-Tenant Board or paying for groceries. Oh, yes. Our government believes that no Ontarian should have to make that choice, and at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, this amendment would mean that all Ontarians, whether they're rich or poor, would have the same access to justice. Here, here. Thank you. New question. The member from Renfrew, Nipperson, Pembroke. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, yesterday in Justice Committee, your predecessor's former Chief of Staff 
David Livingston once again came up with a case of selective amnesia. He had a hard time recalling his role in your Liberal gas plant scandal. To make matters worse, he saw nothing wrong with his deleting emails and breaking document retention laws. Week after week, Liberal staffers have come before the committee and either say they don't recall or have deliberately misled members of the committee. Premier, when are you going to start taking your party's flagrant abuse of taxpayers seriously? Instruct your former staff to cooperate with the committee and finally start providing some answers. Premier. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is that on this side of the House, those members who have been called to appear in front of the committee have, including Mr. Livingston that was mentioned. It's very interesting now, Mr. Speaker, that again, to go to the point of, uh, of an answer I gave yesterday, the fact that the PC party so aggressively was opposed to the plants, said they were the only party if they formed government, that they would cancel them. What's interesting, Mr. Speaker, is over and over and over again, we have asked those failed PC candidates who had robocalls, who had tweets, who had uh, press releases, who went around saying we are the only ones. We've asked them to come before a committee to talk about their costing, to talk about their analysis. And, Mr. Speaker, there has been a concerted effort on the part of the PCs to Answer. make sure none of them would show up. So I asked the honourable member in his supplementary to tell us when he will encourage the PC candidates to show up and tell their side of the story. Thank you. Back to the Premier. Premier, transparency is about providing answers, and you have failed miserably on that account. Current and former Liberal staffers have come before the committee only to have their testimony contradicted by senior bureaucrats. There are emails indicating that senior Liberal operatives were plotting an attempt to, in, to influence the Speaker to change a ruling. Yeah. Premier, you don't want to get to the bottom of this scandal because you're afraid of what we're going to find. Exactly. Will you commit today? And only the changes can only be made here. It's not about letting committee work. Your House Leader has a job to do. Will you commit to instructing him today to expand the scope of the committee, the mandate of the Justice Committee, to include asking questions about your Liberal operatives' attempts to influence the Speaker. And will you finally... I will... Uh, really tough from this spot. I've ruled on this once before, and a second time, I'm asking the member to stay away from an already ruled upon issue, rephrase the question to include what you're looking for, but without the issue that has been ruled on. As I said before, <laughs> and will you finally instruct your staff and advisors to regain their memory and tell the truth? Mr. Speaker, uh, you know it's a little bit disappointing the uh, the games that that member is uh, engaging in this morning here in the legislature. the speaker's ruling. He is an individual who knows the procedures of this house. Uh, an issue arose before the Justice Committee and there were a number of different avenues that could be taken. His House Leader decided to, with, with very appropriate notice to you, Mr. Speaker, several weeks, to move ahead with a, uh, a notice of privilege. As such, that was the route that they chose. Some of the other routes that uh, we talked about at House Leaders' meetings were not then available. Uh, the Honourable Member raised it through a letter, and you gave a very clear and fulsome ruling, Mr. Speaker. And in light of that ruling, I am open, as the Premier said, to having further discussions with the House Leaders. But I I think your ruling was very instructive Answer. about the nature of the meeting and the nature of meetings that you have as Speaker, and that, of course, is a context that we would have any further discussions. Thank you. Question the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Hamilton Irving Corps is a community health centre in my riding that delivers care to some of the neediest people in the province. After 17 years of dedicated service, it's stuck in a cramped and broken-down building because of chronic underfunding. Now the Lynn wants to uh, cram the CHC into an even smaller facility speaker and cut oral health and foot care from their mandate, even though 
18 other CHCs in the province offer these very essential services. Will the minister so, show some leadership and step in to protect the vital services provided by the Hamilton Urban Core, or does she agree with the local Lynn that the CHC should be cutting vital oral health and foot care services to my constituents? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Speaker, I am uh, delighted to welcome members of the Urban Corps uh, CHC here. I am a big champion of CHCs. I think you know that. We've, uh, we've been able to expand 19 CHCs, new capital projects across the province. In fact, we've more than doubled, we've almost doubled the number of CHCs in this province. It is a fantastic model speaker. It provides holistic care to people who uh, might face barriers to, to the, uh, receiving the care that they deserve. So I know that the CHC and the Lynn are working together to find common ground. I want the Urban Corps to know that uh, I, I urge them to continue to work with the Lynn to develop a plan to move forward uh, so we, uh, we can uh, um, meet the needs of the people of downtown Hamilton. Thank you, supplementary. Speaker, for months now, my health critic has been urging the minister to get involved in this issue. I finally raised it with her personally yesterday. It is not the case that the Lynn is working with the CHC. In fact, it seems as if the Lynn is working against the CHC and against the people in my riding who need vital foot care and oral care services. And this is an unacceptable situation that this minister has known about for a very, very long time. And I am asking her very, very specifically, does she or does she not believe that community health care centres should have a mandate that include foot care, include oral Oral care, and does she not? Does she or does she not believe it's her job to make sure that the people of this province get the health care services that they deserve? That's your job. Yes, sir. Uh, speaker, our commitment to community health centres is clear. Uh, we have almost doubled the number of community health centres. We've almost doubled the number of people served by community health centres. We've increased funding by 140 percent. Our commitment is very clear. Nonetheless, uh, Urban Core must continue to work with the Lynn. That is the structure we have put in place. I urge the, the Community Health Centre to continue to work with the Lynn to find common ground. I look forward to this moving forward, but there's work to do before it can move forward, Speaker. Thank you. The question the member from Scarborough, Rouge River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of our government's commitment to reduce poverty in Ontario. We've seen progress made through the efforts of the poverty reduction strategy. Order. This strategy aims to give children and their families the tools and support they need. There is a lot to be done when it comes to poverty and giving children and youth the best opportunity to reach their potential. Measuring our success is just as crucial as it allows us to enhance our strategy moving forward. My question, Mr. Speaker, is what have been the results to date of the poverty reduction strategy and how it has assisted Ontario families? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Got it? All right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Scarborough Rouge for this uh, very important issue, one that I know resonates with many members in this House and across the province. I'm proud of the progress that we've made through the poverty reduction strategy to date and our support for children and families. Current data indicates that 61,000 children have been prevented from falling into poverty. Additionally, 47,000 were lifted out. I'm very encouraged by these results. We've been able to accomplish this through a range of programs and initiatives. For example, over 950,000 children in 510,000 families are being helped by the Ontario Child Benefit. As well, our Open Minds, Healthy Minds strategy has helped an estimated 35,000 young people deal with mental health and addiction. These are the ways in which we are investing in children and their families, building stronger communities and a healthier Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for that response. I am pleased that we remain committed to reducing poverty and that our initial strategy has delivered results for families in Ontario. In 2009, this government made a long-term commitment to combat poverty through Poverty Reduction Act. A requirement of this act was that a new strategy would be developed every five years. 
It is my understanding that consultations have begun across the province on the development of a renewed strategy to continue to reduce poverty over the next five years. I am personally taking part in a public consultation next month along with my other Scarborough MPPs to gain valuable input from our communities on the next strategy. Could the minister please inform the House on the the uh, member from Hamilton Mountain and the member from ha Hamilton East Stony Creek come to order. Continue, please. Could the minister please inform the House on the progress of these consultations Question. and the steps being taken to reduce poverty in the province? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the member. Speaker, I have to say that I'm proud that it's this government that brought forward the first provincial poverty reduction strategy. It is this government that passed the Poverty Reduction Act. So, Speaker, we are working on poverty reduction. We've been consulting with stakeholders to help develop our second strategy. I personally kicked off consultations in Windsor on August 6 and also held one last week in Thunder Bay. What I'm finding is that people are pleased with the opportunity to provide their feedback on this issue, and their input is important to this issue. Poverty is a complex issue, and we need to hear from all voices. Our goal is that we hear from as many people as possible, and that's what we're working on and the steps that need to be taken. I want to encourage Answer. people across Ontario to participate in these consultations or provide feedback to us online. Speaker, we know there's much more work to do. We all know there Thank is. You. And these New question. The member from the Wiki, Oshawa. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, many Ontarians living with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis are not able to obtain the medication that will help slow the progression of this terrible disease. Esbriet, a drug that has been proven to help manage the symptoms, is not at this time on the approved drug formulary. Patients have applied to the Exceptional Access Program to get funding for Esbriet, but have been denied with no clear answer for the denial. This issue has been before the committee to evaluate drugs for a very long time, yet no decision has been made and no indication when a decision has been made. Minister, will you commit today to speaking with the committee with a view to uh, obtaining a positive answer with respect to funding as soon as possible? Thank you, Speaker. And I, I do welcome uh, people who are advocating for uh, this drug today to the Legislature. I do want to say once again, though, that these are not political decisions. We make decisions on what drugs to fund based on the evidence. Speaker, there is a process uh, that uh, we go through when we make important decisions about what drugs to fund. And with regards to Espriot, Speaker, the Canadian Drug Expert Committee has recommended that Espriot should not be funded because of inconsistent results. We remain open to new evidence, Speaker, but at this point, the evidence to support the public funding of this drug does not has not been presented uh, to the committee to evaluate drugs. Answer. So we we clearly will open are open to new evidence, but at this time, the evidence does not support funding. Thank you. Member from Timmins James Bay on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to move a motion in order to pass the tanning bed legislation at second reading. James Bay has asked for unanimous consent to call second reading of the bill without debate and a vote. Do we agree? On March the 19th, 2013, Ms. Matthews moved second reading of Bill 30. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? 
Second reading of the bill, does he lecture to the Loire? Shall the bill be referred for third reading? No. Yes. I recognize. We got this. I heard a no. Therefore, the bill is referred to committee. Minister of Health. I move that third reading of Bill 30. from Renfrew remembers something, I hope he does. And I think you were reminding him. Having said that, we still have to finish what we started. I need to, uh, this, this bill has been uh, for second reading into a committee. The minister has an opportunity to put it into the committee that she so desires. Excuse me. Excuse me. I got this. I, I got this. It doesn't preclude the minister from doing something else, but I need to get it to a committee. Sir, I would like to refer this to general government. The bill is now referred to the general government committee. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I move unanimous consent for a third reading of Bill 30. And hey! We're, I'm, I'm working through this. It's quite right. I got it. I think we, I think we mean land where we want to land. You're seeking unanimous consent to discharge the bill from committee, put it to third reading with no debate and passage. That is the unanimous consent. Do we have unanimous consent? I heard a no. Committee. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.